Today we continue our study on God's grace. Today we look at God's grace. God accomplishes what he says he will do. God accomplishes what he says he will do. Margaret has sung very beautifully about the sweet little Jesus boy. And this is what this time of the year and throughout the year is about. It's not about us. It is about Jesus, who he is and what he has accomplished for us. And this actually begins before the foundation of the world, before God created anything. He had his eternal decree. And every day that you and I live, his eternal decree works out in your life and in my life personally. And it's for his glory and for his good. But this morning, I want us to look and focus in on Jesus and how God accomplished what he said he would do. Before we begin our study, I want you to look at the outline in the bulletin. And I want you to look at the litany of scripture verses that I have there. I know you're thinking we'll never get out of this worship service. That is a long list of scripture verses. And I did that on purpose. We're not going to look at all of them today so you all can relax. But I would encourage you to take each one of those verses in the order I have listed them. It gives a little more detail than what I will cover today on how God accomplished this. We're just going to look at the highlights today. But I trust it and encourage you either this afternoon or someday this week, sit down with those passages and you can just see how God in his eternal decree worked everything out for his glory and for our good. So we're just going to look at a few. Now, I would like for you to make two columns in that outline. If you, if you are a note taker, you need to make two columns. On one column, you need to list these names. You need to put Noah, Abraham, Moses, David, and Jeremiah. Noah, Abraham, Moses, David, and Jeremiah. In the other column, you need to list Jesus Christ. And this is going to be the outline that we're going to follow. As we see that God accomplishes what he says he's going to do. And we're going to begin in Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. This is where we begin, Genesis 2, 15 through 17. So shall we pray before we study? Father in heaven, we're so humbled by your love and your grace to us and how you work in us both to will and to do of your good pleasure. I pray that as we continue to worship you now through the reading and teaching of your word that you'll keep the evil one from us, that you'll instruct us by your Holy Spirit from your word. Give us understanding of your eternal decree and it involves our lives personally in the salvation that you provided for us in Christ. That you will be honored, that your children will be spiritually refreshed and renewed. And that those lost in sin would come to know Christ as Savior. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's stand for the reading of God's holy word. Genesis chapter 2, 15 through 17. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Amen. You may be seated. God has sovereignly created everything. He created mankind in his image. 
There was fellowship between God and mankind because in Genesis chapter 3, we see where uh, God was there in the garden in the cool of the evening. And so, so there's fellowship, there's perfect holiness, perfect righteousness, no sin whatsoever. And then we come to Genesis chapter 3, verses 6 and 7. God has given clear instructions that we've just read in chapter 2. You do not eat from this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Do not do this because if you do, you will die. Clear teaching, clear understanding. Now look at Genesis 3, 6 and 7. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food... And that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise. She took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. What we must glean from this, God did not make them eat that fruit. They did it on their own initiative. We talk about man's free will. The only two people that had a true free will were Adam and the woman. There was no sin. And on their own volition, the woman decided, my way is better than God's, so we'll eat of the tree. And the husband went along with it. And as a result of the act of their own free will, they plunge not only themselves, but the rest of us into sin. Because the name Adam in Hebrew means mankind. So everybody goes into sin. And God said in Genesis 2, if you eat, you die. And God allowed them to exercise their will. Even though it was against his, he allowed that to happen. So now they died. And we see what that death means. It says that when they ate the fruit, their eyes were open. What does that mean? Were they walking around with their eyes closed? We're not thinking physically here. We're thinking spiritually. They died spiritually. They had a new perception in life that God to this point had withheld from them that knowledge of evil. So they personally disobeyed God. They personally experienced sin in their lives, which is rebellion against God. And so spiritually they died. Now they are dominated by sin. And so when God comes to them in the cool of the evening, what did they do? They jumped in the bushes. They ran from God. And people have been running from God ever since because of the sinfulness of their hearts. So God said, you eat, you die. And guess what happened? They died. But you and I must realize in this passage, God didn't make them eat it. It was their own doing. So God didn't say, God didn't hit them on the rear end and say, go eat some of that fruit. They did on their own. But what we see here is God warned them, don't do this. And they did it, and they suffered the consequences. And so what God says is going to come to pass will come to pass. And what God says he's going to do, he's going to do it. So now we go from Adam and the woman to Noah. Genesis chapter 6. In Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5, we're told that the thoughts and intents of man are continually evil. And then when we also look at Genesis uh, chapter 6, we see an interesting thing about Noah. Look at Genesis 6, 8. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the uh, Lord... These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. That's why Noah found favor in the eyes of God. 
Because with whatever knowledge Noah had about God and how to live a life pleasing to God, Noah conducted his life in a manner that was pleasing to God. And the verb there, to walk, is a very strong Hebrew word. It's intensive, reflective. It means he knocked himself out to do that. It wasn't a casual, I'll obey God if it's convenient for me. He was focused on living a life that's pleasing to God, and he saw the ungodliness all around him. And so as Noah walked with God, God blessed Noah. And, and that's, why we, that's why it's uh, translated, Noah found grace in the eyes of God. Noah discovered in deeper ways God's grace because of Noah's faithfulness to God. And then we know that God destroyed the world with water, flooded the place. And then in, in uh, Genesis chapter 8, Noah came off the ark with his family, his children, uh, his sons and his uh, daughters-in-law. And they, chapter 9, there's a restatement of the uh, creational mandate. And in Genesis chapter 9, God made a covenant with Noah. And in that covenant, he promised never to destroy the earth by flood again. And he put the rainbow in the sky as a sign for that covenant. That covenant is eternal. Therefore, brothers and sisters, when you see a rainbow in the sky, that's God's covenant promise to Noah that he'll never destroy the world by a flood. And that's your the promise for you and me as well. And so we say that the covenant with Noah is a covenant of preservation. Now let me ask you, has God flooded the world since then? There have been floods in nations and communities, but the entire world? No, he does what he says he's going to do. And so God preserved a people for himself. Now, under Jesus Christ, Luke chapter 19, verse 10 under, uh, under Christ, Luke chapter 19, verse 10, Luke says uh, uh, about Jesus, Jesus says, I have come to seek and to save that which was lost. And that's why Jesus came, to seek and to save that which was lost. Those that God had chosen before the foundation of the world, Jesus Christ came to bring freedom from the bondage of sin and death to those that would trust in him alone for salvation. God says, I'll do this, and he did it. And so uh, every man and woman, young person, child, everyone who acknowledges to God they are sinners, and they believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and that he came and he died on the cross, satisfying the wrath of God on our behalf, and was raised from the dead, everyone who trusts in Christ alone for salvation has eternal life. Your baptism and your church membership will get you in hell faster than anything else. It's only faith in Christ and Christ alone. God said he'd do it, and he did it. Now, let's go to Abraham. There's a covenant of preservation fulfilled in Christ. Abraham. When Abraham, God called Abraham to himself, God said, I'm going to make you a, I'm going to make a great nations come out of you. I'm going to give you a land. And I will be your God and a God to your generations. And then he said, as long as you place the sign of the covenant, on all males, eight days of age and older. This is in Genesis 17. Abraham said, yes, sir, I believe you. And so he did it. Let's turn to Revelation chapter 21. We go from Genesis to Revelation. I told you we were going to cover the scriptures today. Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 7. Jesus Christ has come. There's been the judgment of works. The non-believer's been cast into the lake of fire for eternity. All who are trusting in Christ are with the Lord. Now look at Genesis, uh, Revelation 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. 
And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And he who is seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. That language, I will be with them, they will dwell with me, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. If you read Genesis chapter 17, you see the exact same language. The promise that God made to Abraham to make a great nation out of him, to give him a land, and to be his God. We have that in Christ. Christ fulfilled that. And you and I will experience it completely and fully, either at our own death, where we go to be with the Lord, because to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. We will experience that. Or if God in his providence, we should live to the second coming. And when we're caught up together to be with the cloud in the Lord's, and that's where we'll ever be with the Lord, we will have that there. That's the hope that you and I have in Christ, and that's fulfilled in Christ. So there's a, the preservation and the promise. Now, we don't have a land. We don't have a nation here where all Christians are in this nation. No, that's something to look forward to in heaven, in the new heaven, in the new earth. That's what you and I have in Christ. So Christ fulfilled the covenant with Noah. He fulfilled the covenant with Abraham. Then we look at Moses. God called Moses. God delivered his children out of Egypt. They were in the land of bondage. They couldn't get out on their own. God graciously delivered them. And then we go to Exodus chapter 20 where God gives the law. We, the Ten Commandments or the moral law. And so God gives these, but we have a tendency to jump into the law and we don't look at the first two verses. And the first two verses say, I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of the land of bondage, out of the house of Israel, uh, Egypt. God delivered, that's grace. God had a plan. He delivered them out and then he gave the law to them. Now, Jesus fulfill the law. Look at Matthew chapter 5. Look at the gospel of Matthew chapter 5. This is the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5. And we're going to look at verses 17 and 18 as Jesus is teaching and he tells his relationship to the law of God. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Jesus fulfilled the law on our behalf. We'll never be condemned by the law of God because of our faith in Christ. Jesus says in John 14, 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So instead of trying to keep the legalistic law of God because of the love of God shown to you and me and his son, Jesus Christ, we reciprocate that love back to him in obedience to his word. We show the Lord that we love him so much and so we obey him and walk in him. Brothers and sisters, you don't want to become a Pharisee. 
Do you ever see in the, in the Gospels of Pharisee with any joy? No. Have you ever met a Pharisee? If you don't, I'll point out a few of them for you. They never smile. Pounding, it's always authoritative. There's no joy. You don't want to become like that. We follow the Lord because we love him and he loves us. And that law is fulfilled. We're not bound. We're not condemned. We're free from the bondage of sin and death. And we demonstrate our love for the Lord by walking in obedience. Your walk in obedience is a walk of love of Christ. And so we have the Mosaic Covenant fulfilled in Christ. The next one is David. David, the king. You remember after David had, had taken Jerusalem and he made it the capital and also uh, brought the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem. You remember he said, uh, he was sitting in his den one night and he said, here I am in my panel den and God's out there in a tent. I'm going to build him a house. Nathan the prophet said, yeah, go ahead, it's fine. That night God appeared to Nathan and said, no, he's not going to build me a house. I'll determine that. But I will do this. And in 2 Samuel chapter 7, God spoke to David through Nathan the prophet. I will establish your throne forever. I will establish your throne forever. And Jesus' lineage is through the line of David. And he is the king. He is the king. And when he stood, when Jesus stood before Pilate, what did he say? Pilate said, you are a king. And Jesus said, it is, you said. But my kingdom is not of this world. It's a spiritual kingdom. Jesus is our king. We answer to Jesus. We're obedient to Jesus. We're committed to Christ. Don't ever commit to a denomination. Denominations are run by people, sinful people, saved by grace. You and I follow Christ. And then you're in a church that will teach the Bible to you and teach it properly. If you're ever in a church and, and the Bible is read and it's put down and closed and you start hearing a moral story, get up and walk out. They're not teaching the Word of God. We need the Word of God. We're committed to Christ, our King. We are in His kingdom. And He is the eternal kingdom. So now Christ fulfilled the Davidic covenant by becoming the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You see the continuity between the Old and the New Testament, how Christ fulfills everything in the Old Testament. Jeremiah. Jeremiah the prophet. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 31. Jeremiah 31. 31 through 34. Jeremiah is the only prophet that prophesies about the new covenant. He's the only one. In Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke... Though I was their husband, declares the Lord, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they all shall know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. The new covenant, the new covenant in Christ 
in Luke chapter 22 and verse 20, when Jesus was instituting the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, and he took the cup. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for many. And he changes our hearts. And Christ alone, the Son of God, is the only one who can change the heart of an individual. You and I can't change our own hearts. You and I cannot change anybody else's heart. That's in the hand of God and God alone. We can pray for people to come to know Christ and we should we can pray for those to be obedient to the Lord and we should but we can't change them but when someone comes into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ that heart is changed from a heart of stone and death and destruction to a heart of life and flesh and a desire for the Lord And if Jesus Christ is your Savior, you know exactly what I'm talking about because you've experienced it. And that's fulfilled in Christ. Our lives and life itself is all about Christ. Think about this. This, this, this is awesome. Jesus, that little baby in the manger, totally human in nature, but without sin. Calvin says, at the time that that baby was in the manger, he was still the omnipotent God of the universe. They created all things and sustained all things and came to die for the sin of his people. That's who Jesus is. He's God. He's God. He's the Son of God. And in Him and Him alone do we have eternal life. Boy, this is a time of the year you and I have ample opportunity to talk about Christ. To let people sense the love of God in our hearts. The love for, for Christ. And our concern for the lost. But it won't happen if our hearts are full of sin and crusty. Full of self-centeredness and selfishness and whatever sin you want to call. It won't come across. God does what he says he's going to do. Genesis 3.15 in Genesis 3.15, after the fall, God was cursing the serpent. God made this statement. The seed, of the, the seed of the serpent will bruise the heel of the seed of the woman. And the seed of the woman would crush the head of the seed of the serpent. And that was the first promise of the Messiah. God said, this will happen. And it has happened in Christ. It has happened. And so God is a God who says he will do something and he does it. And you and I can trust that he will do that. Do you trust him? Do you trust him? He does what he says he's going to do. So when we come to the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, we have all these covenants and all these promises that God made to his people. And God has fulfilled every one of them. And there, there's basically one left, and that's the second coming and in his timing, that will take place as well. We don't know when, 
But we know it is going to happen. And so when you and I, in just a moment, observe the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, and you and I hold that bread, that bread is a symbol of the body of Christ. The body of Christ that has taken your sin and mine on himself and satisfied the holy and just and righteous wrath of God on himself so you and I will never, never face the condemnation or the wrath of God. And when you and I hold a cup of juice, which is a symbol of the blood of Christ, you and I think about the blood of Christ that washes away our sin, that's taken away that sin, and the life is in the blood, and that life of Christ was poured out, and he died that we would live. God said he would do it, and God did it. Have you experienced it personally? Trusting in Christ alone for salvation. The Apostle Paul said when, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 that when you gather together to worship the Lord and observe the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, that we are to examine our hearts. And the word examine there means to examine thoroughly and carefully. And any sin that the Holy Spirit reveals to you personally, you're to confess it to the Lord, to repent and ask for forgiveness. And then you come to the Lord's table. And we believe that as we come to the Lord's table, having confessed and repented of sin and asking for forgiveness, we are forgiven. And we believe by the faith that God's given to us, through this sacrament, he imparts his grace to his children for his glory and for our spiritual nourishment. So, brothers and sisters, the, the, the warning to examine the heart is not to keep us away, but it's that we would come cleansed in the blood of Christ to worship and to be spiritually refreshed and renewed. So if you're sitting here today and you're thinking, I've got this sin in me and, and I can't take the Lord's Supper, yes, you can, but you must confess and repent and then come. You need the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. I need it. But I do not come holding sin in my life because Paul says in that same passage, you'll eat and drink condemnation. God doesn't take lightly the sin in our lives and our whitewashing it and justifying it. He wants it confessed, repented of, and to be asked for forgiveness. And when you and I do that, you and I are forgiven. So we come to partake of the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ and you have examined your life before the Lord and whatever sin you have, you have confessed and repented of that sin and asked for forgiveness, you are forgiven. Now, if you are a non-believer, if you don't believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior, do not partake of this. You are condemned already. As Jesus tells us in John 3, 18, you're condemned already because you don't believe in the Son of God. Do not partake of this. I will love to talk to you after this worship service so you may know Jesus Christ is your Savior. So let's prepare our hearts to worship the Lord in the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. As the ruling elders come to serve, let's bow our heads and pray. And once again, examine our hearts. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, we thank you that you are indeed the true and living God and besides you that there are no other gods and that you are a God of your word, that what you say you will do, you will do it 
And you have shown us very clearly from your word today that you promised salvation through the Messiah. And the Messiah has come, your son, your only son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He has come. He has lived. He was crucified on the cross, taking our sin upon himself, satisfying your holy and just and righteous wrath on himself for our sin. He shed his blood on the cross, pouring his life out that we may live. And he was raised on the third day. He ascended into heaven and he's seated at your right hand where he ever lives to make intercession for us. Oh, Father, we are a sinful people. And I confess the sin that is in our hearts and repent. And I pray that you forgive us and we thank you for that forgiveness and that cleansing. So may you be honored in our hearts. May your children be spiritually refreshed and renewed as we observe the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.